so let's pray and uh, the Holy Spirit I believe really wants to do a great work of freedom and revelation and faith inside us this morning and he's there I believe he's already been preaching this message to you probably your whole Christian life uh, but other stuff stuff has been dumped in your brain and it goes like eh, no it can't be you can't be that good eh, you can't be that big you can't be that amazing so Holy Spirit we welcome you uh, to, to, to your work to us and, and inside us and your work through us and Holy Spirit you are our teacher and uh, I'm your assistant so we just pray for that spirit of wisdom and revelation to be released in this room and that great faith would come because it's your faith and not ours great freedom would come because it's your reality and not our screwed up one and that we would enter a new season of joy and faith and breakthrough because we've understood better who we are and who you are amen Amen. Okay, so we did a job mostly last week of deconstructing what is commonly thought of to be good news. And I'll just quickly recap. So we, in, we've used pictures to try and explain how people tend to think of the gospel as like, there's, there's people and matter and there's God and he's holy and there's a gap between the two and we have to get back to him through, obviously there's, there's Jesus in there as well, the cross, we drew the cross in the middle, but then we have to realize and repent and believe and pray, read the Bible, you know, all these things that get us to get closer to God who can't be close to us because of the mess and all the, all the sin and all that, etc., etc., etc. And actually, that construction, what we said last week, is Neoplatonism with Bible verses on, it isn't the gospel. Sorry, that's what we kind of took a lot of time to say no to that last week uh, and explain that the roots of it are actually much more in Greek thinking and it was uh, adopted by St. Augustine. I, I, I am denied about wearing my Athanasius hoodie today because we're really deeply into him this week okay you don't know that but he's he's my hero because he's, he's one of the fathers of this view of the gospel that we're gonna look at this is something that has affected the western church from about 400 AD onwards it's all through Catholicism and this this thinking was profoundly drawn on by the reformers as well so it's in the protestant thinking and tradition as well and we said eh, no sorry lots of there's truth in it but it isn't reality okay it's not a description of reality reality is a really important thing it's not just you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free the greek root word for that in in john 8 is you will know reality and reality will set you free and what we've been baptized into is a dualistic reality that matter is separate from God and that there's therefore an existence somehow we don't quite know why but there's an existence that is separate from God so there's a, such a thing as ordinary life there is you know you can just get on with it and he's not really involved because he's always a little bit removed that's dualism and it's fake but we've been persuaded that that is the reality that we live in in some form. So you wake up Monday morning, here I go in my ordinary life, that's not true. Okay, quickly. And the result of that thinking is inside us we get this division because we also looked at how God, we think he's a judge and he gives rules and uh, and you end up coming to church and coming to God and just wanting to show him the shiny side and because we think God can't look on our sin, we hide the yucky bits, which we all have some, all right? There's some, there's some pain, there's some dysfunction, there's some things, probably things we don't always want to admit to ourselves and certainly not to one another. And we certainly don't bring them to church and we're worried if we bring them to God that he's going to go, oh, I can't look at that nonsense. And it creates pain and dysfunction and disassociation inside believers and there's quite a lot of mental health issues in believers 
because of the way, the construct they put on, the lens they look at God and the Bible. Okay? So we, we get a lot of issues because of the view of reality we've inherited. It affects the way we think about church and all stuff that we just touched on briefly. The implications are massive. And then we looked at Colossians 1. And the circle's meant to represent Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It, it's broken lines because you know, God's, God's not, he's not finite, is he? But you've got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the perichoresis, the dance in all eternity of love between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they, they create the universe, but the universe lives inside them. That was the big thing we landed on, and, and it's, it's going to take us a while just to let that thought marinate that actually, in Christ, everything was made, and in Christ, everything is sustained. There is no existence separate from him. Everything, all right? Everything, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities. So the invisible realm and the visible realm, nothing exists, nothing was made or came into existence apart from Jesus, and nothing has life or continuity or sustenance apart from Jesus. All of existence, however you think of it, is made and sustained in God, not separate from God. There is no existence apart from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's just worth letting that settle in your spirit. Right now, your bones are enveloped, sustained by Jesus. Your brain, your blood, your breath. This. Existence exists because he's made it and he's holding it together all the time right now. Okay? So that's kind of where we, where we landed to start to tell the story of salvation in a different way. That was a re recap, really. There's no such thing as another life. We've already said that, so let's move on to the love story. Because you end up in a bit of a horror show with that one. If you've got to hide your dark spots and you... but the whole point of all of existence is a love story. And if you start in the right place, you'll end up with the right answers. And the, some, the trouble with some of us is, over the, over the centuries, we started at the point of there's a problem and there's sin, so how do we fix it? And, and I've watched Jan Mack touch type, so she's looking at you and she's like... But if you put your fingers on the keyboard in the wrong place and do that you're going to end up with you know you'll end up with God but you'll, you'll get words the same length and spaces in the right place but when you try and read it it won't make any sense so it's really important that we get our fingers on the right place as we start to try and re-explain this story okay otherwise we'll have sentences and spaces but actually it isn't the sense that God would give the other thing I would like to say about the other way of looking at it is the human mind can come up with that. In fact, so that, that, that kind of graph, that kind of graphic that we came up with about separation and going through the stages is very common in actually all religions. But actually what Paul says is that this gospel is something that no mind could conceive of. It cannot come out. It, it, the human imagination is incapable of dreaming up what God has revealed through his son. So if it's something we can easily slot into our kind of functional universe, it's probably not true, is, is what I'm saying. So the love story. You see, what we inherited was a bit of an earth to heaven gospel. It was like, well, we have a problem. Man's fallen. Things are going wrong. We're in a fallen universe. The sin. How does, has God fixed it? And we end up with, here's the problem. God, what are you doing? And that's, that's St. Augustine. Athanasius was a heaven-to-earth man. And a long time ago now as a church, we started on this heaven-to-earth journey. 
And the inevitable conclusion is going to be that you discover the heaven to earth gospel. And the truth is that God had us in Christ before he lost us in Adam. It's just worth pausing occasionally when you and that's what we're going to explain. So there's, there's, there's a love dream. And what's fascinating about this, just read these verses with me. Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us in him, in Jesus, before, what? Before the creation of the world. To be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to what? Through Jesus Christ in accordance with his what? Pleasure and will. And then you think, well, it's only one verse. Yeah, well, there's actually loads of them. When you start to see this, it's everywhere. 2 Timothy 1.9. Let's do it together. He saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done. All right? Not because of anything we have done but because of his own purpose and grace, and this is the kicker, this will melt your brain, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Hello? <laughs> Boom! And, and I could, you know, if I had more time, I could take you to a few other places where it basically says God's heart, God's plan was actually all dreamed up, all purposed, and all done before time started. Before there was a creation, there was you, and God loved you, and he planned for you, and he'd given you grace before even existence began. Ha! And nothing you can do about it, it's all from him. You don't even have to want it for him to have done it for you. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? That, can't, that violates something in us independent thinking Westerners. But you don't have to want this. You don't have to seek this for God to have already done it for you because he knew you before the foundation of the world, before time began. Too bad. If you don't want it, too bad. But you still have it if you want it. <laughs> And Revelation 13, 8, is, this is a bit of a, a bonkers one as well, but it fits the others, which is why I put it in there, is that <clears throat> it's a bit out of context, but the point is names are written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I thought Jesus was slain on a cross somewhere about 33 AD, but something in the mist, we're into the realm of of the mystery of God here, that the whole plan was always that you were included in Christ who was going to be slain on a cross to redeem us back to the original plan. So it's not like God went, oh gosh, there's a problem, how am I going to fix it? It's, it think of it like this. Say, say you, you're a family with a bit of money and you start, to have a fa you start to have children of your own and you think, I really want them to go to university. So you put 30 grand in the bank even while you're still pregnant. I mean, you, you need resources to do that but, that, but God's got resources. It's a bit like that. He knows what's coming, so it's already in the bank. Are you excited about it? It's okay to not understand it and be excited by it at the same time. Because what's going to go on inside of us is the Holy Spirit is going to go leaping up and down saying, yeah, yeah, and our brains are going tilt, tilt, because we've been raised in this dualism thing for so long, but just get happy anyway, all right? Just let the happiness break out because our minds need to be renewed in order for us to be transformed. That's what we'll land on at the end of this Talk glory. Everybody okay? Still alive? Getting a bit excited? He's loved us from before time. All right, pictures. So that, that's me having a go with Jesse's help to 
There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and there's us in the middle, loved, before matter even exists. We're beating around in the... His heart is beating full of us and for us. Awesome. And then he makes a planet to stick us on, and everything looks tickety-boo. Go, God! He's walking in the garden. We're having a great time. It's a beautiful place, etc., etc. And then... Eh, eh. Uh-oh, the thing we all knew about as Christians is there was a beautiful garden, but, you know, there's got Adam blaming, Eve. this is Adam and Eve, if you hadn't noticed, and the serpent, and there's the fruit on the ground that she ate, but, you know, they blame each other, and the serpent is grinning an evil grin because he basically got his way. And this is the thing, as Christians, we call the fall. This is a catastrophic moment Although that's a funny cartoon. This is a catastrophic moment for all of creation because God had trusted these two with his physical creation to steward it and then they doubted him. Listen to what the serpent, which is a picture of the devil, said. They disobeyed God because they didn't really believe God and suddenly we get this thing called the fall which has often been typified as lots of sins happening, but it's much deeper and more profound than that. What happens is that beautiful thing, darkness, covers the earth. It's still in Jesus, all right? So it's not suddenly dropped out because... Oh, so it's still there because of him, it's still alive because of him, but there's a darkness that has come about. And what's important is to understand what the darkness is about. So, when God said, don't eat the fruit from that tree, he said, you will surely die if you do. And the tree was the knowledge of good and evil, okay? We haven't got lots of time to go. But he said, if you eat this, you're going to die. And he didn't say, it's not like you're going to die. It says, you will die. And the world fell into death at that moment. And that death looks like this, that all of creation go, comes into this thing that Romans 8 calls a bondage to decay. Yet somehow Jesus mercifully and graciously is in it, sustaining it for all time. Humanity goes into the bondage of an... A, the darkness is an alienation mindset. You have to read... You have to get rid of your dualistic junk out of your head and read scripture like it is and you'll start to see that actually we banished ourselves from God's presence. He didn't kick us out of his presence. So Ephesians 4, 17 to 18 is a good one. But I ask you to read Colossians. Colossians 1, 21 basically says that. That we, we were hostile. We start to move into a place of hostility to God. We, actually the Ephesians 4 bit says that we, uh, the expanded version says, if you look in the Amplified, we have self-banished ourselves from him in our alienated mindset. Who moved? We did. Who came looking for Adam and Eve in the garden? God did. Who hid? They did, and we've been hiding in the darkness of the bushes ever since, thinking it's him who stepped away from us when it's we moved away from him. And that flip where we blame him for where our mindset has gone wrong is absolutely crucial that we recover the truth, that we, when we give in to that, we're slipping back into the death mindset that is in the unredeemed community. That's actually part of the death that came in through Adam's fall as he ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was to think that God pushed you away in some form or other. And that every morning, Monday morning when you wake up and you don't feel him, it's because he's gone quiet or you, did, you had a good time Sunday morning, but something went wrong Sunday afternoon, or you didn't pray enough first thing Monday morning, and somehow some distance has come in. That's utter junk. 
This is a happy tune, actually. And humanity in that moment came into bondage to sin. So the, the one who deceived them wrapped them up in sin. And that has power and it has consequences like sickness and poverty and brokenness and guilt and hurt and some of that dark, hurty bit on the inside of the human heart. That's out of this thing called sin. We, we, do, the, we do things and we are, bad things are done to us and it's, it's a bondage and it's hard to break out of, okay? That's the darkness that we inherit, that all of humanity inherits because of, of Adam. That led to that and that. Look it out. Happy-ish. Oh, thank God. Thank God he put the 30 grand in the bank before all of that happened. So he sent Jesus into the darkness. He already had a plan. And he joined, this is that sinful, all those things, the brokenness, the sinfulness, the bondage, the decay, God in Jesus came and joined himself to the crap and the junk. He stepped into it rather than away from it. Once again, he came for his creation. One, one of the early church fathers puts it something like this. He says, what was God being good to do, knowing that his beautiful love creation was falling into a state of non-being? Well, what God being loved to do was to step again in, right into his fallen creation by sending his son and joining with it because God decided he was not going to be God without being human forever. There's a man now in Jesus sitting on the throne. God doesn't want to be God without you. No matter how broken up we were, he didn't want to be God without us. And he stepped into our reality to save us, whether we wanted saving or not, whether we knew we needed saving or not. Okay? Isn't that beautiful? God has chosen not to be God apart from you. Just let that sink in a minute. He doesn't, want to be a, he doesn't want to be who he is without having you with him in mystical, beautiful, deep union. How significant does that make you? God doesn't want to be himself without you. Can't dwell on I'm not time. So Jesus comes into the world he dies on a cross, he's raised from the dead, and that puts light everywhere. The light came into the world, darkness rejected it, but that doesn't mean the light isn't everywhere, it just means that people are blind. It's not the same. You can have a blindfold on and think it's dark, it doesn't mean it's not light. That's what changed when he came, all right? The darkness had to flee when Jesus was raised from the dead. He put light everywhere through everything because of his death and resurrection. The difficulty is that in our minds we remain darkened in our understanding. That doesn't mean there's no light. So the flip that has to happen is what's, how we're conceiving of reality, not reality itself. I'm going to say that again. The thing that has to change is the way we believe think about things, not how things actually really are. And what dualism, what our Greek history has done, has persuaded us of a reality that is fake. This, the light of the world has come. He came, he died, he rose from the dead. He, shot, he resurrected and he raised us with him. He sh his light has come. His light is in the darkness. There is no dark place in the world where light isn't. And darkness cannot either 
overcome it or comprehend it. That's the Gospel of John at the beginning. This is good news, guys. But this is reality, not the separation stuff that tends to come up in our brains. But something has to happen in the darkened understanding that we start to move into a, a revelation and enjoyment of the reality that he has already established. Okay? So, we, I asked you to look at Colossians. We're going we're gonna to turn to Colossians and see. I've got to try and land this in a happy place. Colossians 1. I'm going to read it from, yeah, I'm just going to have to read it from 19. So, the first bit, 15 to 19, is what we did last week, which is, I'm reading from the NIV that all of existence came into being in him and is held together by him. Verse 19, he, God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things are in heaven by, or on earth by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So all that alienation and all that stuff we talked about, whereas we blamed God and we moved away from him and we started to self-distance and we, we got in a place of actual anger towards God. And what the cross shows us is that when God appears in his fullness, so Jesus completely represents God in a completely full way, all right? So he is God. When God shows up to mankind, what mankind wants to do is kill him and does. That's how fallen humanity became in its darkness, was that God can actually show up in perfect human form, be God in front of them, and what humanity does is kill God. Or try to. Is this this making sense? That's how alienated we became through the fall. And what Jesus did through his cross is actually end the animosity. He brought peace to you. Verse 21 says, You are enemies in your minds because of evil behavior. Hello? We were enemies in our minds because of evil behavior. And here we see that he, (laughs) this is just too much, he reconciled everything to himself. All the things he made powers, rulers, authorities, heaven, earth, time, space, everything got reconciled back to him at the cross. He reconciled every human being that did exist, that is existing and will exist, back to himself at the cross. He reconciled your shiny parts and your dark parts back to himself at the cross. Whether you wanted, had the, whether he had your permission or not, whether you allowed him in to do it or not, he did it at the cross. He reconciled, just say it with me, all things. All things. Wow. Well, maybe you left out my big toe. No, even my big toe is reconciled to Jesus. Even if my big toe was sticking out of the baptism pool when I was baptized, it's still reconciled to Jesus. Because it's not down to the works I've done, it's down to the work he's already done. Hello? Come on, this is a happy tune here. (laughs) Everything Adam lost, Christ redeemed. So remember, before he lost us in Adam, he had us in Christ, because he'd already got us sorted in Jesus, before foundation of the world, before time. Oh, we were enemies in our minds, we've looked on this, and the cross made peace. The blood of Jesus, 
The blood of the bulls and the goats could only outwardly cleanse. The thing about the blood of Jesus, if you read carefully through Hebrews, is it's powerful to cleanse our conscience. It gets on the inside of you to cleanse the stain of sin and therefore cleanse away the, the animosity and the guilt of dead works that keeps you, stepping, keeps you stepping away and stepping away and stepping away rather than stepping in. The blood of Jesus is powerful enough to cleanse your inner person. In fact, it's cleansed it. Jump in and enjoy the freedom. <sighs> Nearly done. And he presented us holy and without blemish and free from accusation. Remember, this is all with nothing we do. Everything he's done brings us and makes us holy, not as a stuck on like, you know, I'm wearing a nice new hoodie today. That's my holiness. That's my holiness hoodie. No, he's actually made, my big toe is holy. My blood is holy. My brain is holy. Now, I have to keep submitting it to holiness, but he made us through and through holy. It's not a plastic stuck on thing. It's an inside to outside core of your being revolutionary change that happened at his death and resurrection. Hallelujah! He became sin 2 Corinthians 5 21 that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. Come on! This is good news! is true on Monday morning. Even when you wake up and you feel grotty and you don't want to pray, it's still true you're righteous. Huh. And this is, the, this is the, the final kicker, if there is a kicker, is the mystery that no one could think up is revealed. Is Christ in you. Not in the sky, not next door, not in church, Christ in you. The hope of glory. He wants to reveal to you this morning that he lives in you in his fullness and you didn't put him there. So you can't get him out. <laughs> I just invited Jesus into my life. It's a load of rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb. You realize that Jesus is in your life. Is the mystery now revealed? And you lined up with that reality. That's called repentance. Isn't that good? Oh, I can't get rid of Jesus. This is the mystery revealed. Is when Jesus died and rose again... He put himself inside you. We've made Jesus smaller than Adam, so we all, we've all been taught, if you've been a Christian any length of time, that at the fall, we all, all of creation died in Adam, but we've believed that only a few people got Jesus when he rose from the dead. Well, hang on a minute. My Jesus is bigger than Adam. He put himself inside of everybody. They just don't know it yet. That's the mystery that's being revealed. Everything Adam lost and more, Jesus has recovered. Because he's not just give, you're not ultimately just going to get a body like you got now at resurrection. You're going to get a glorified one. So he's recovered everything Adam lost with some knobs on as well. You see, there he is. And you didn't know. Because somebody told you that he was out there, over there, and you had to invite him in. He's already in. You're already loved. You're already saved. He's already in. But I'm not a universalist. <laughs> You've got to remember that one, aren't you? There he is. It's worth, it's worth going back again. Just to get the wee! (laughs) 
So we're not inviting him in, we're realizing he's there. That's the mystery that's revealed, that's getting saved. That We can skip on from that. Light and life for all through Jesus Christ. Jesus' effect is bigger than Adam's effect. So here we go, a verse. As one trespass led to the condemnation for all men. That's what we see from Adam and Eve in the garden. And we all believe that. Everything went to crap because of them. Everything and everybody... So one act of righteousness, which is about Jesus, leads to justification in life for... Western evangelicals skip over all the all passages because they're scared of being universalists. We're not universalists. I'm not universalist. We're not universalists. But Jesus' action was universal in its outcome. was bigger than what Adam lost, okay? So we accept, what we're talking about here is accepting the new reality with the faith he's giving you because he's already inside people. He starts, he gives them faith. And we have to acknowledge repentance is acknowledging our wrong-headedness about him. Repenting of our sin, our anger, our enmity, blaming him and acknowledging that he loves us He's saved us, he's died for us, he's cleansed us. Repentance is a big deal because it means changing what's going on in our brain and our thinking. And giving thanks that Christ is in me as a free gift, the hope of glory. And the Holy Spirit right now is bringing that, new, that reality alive on the inside of you with no help from me other than I've told you the truth. There you go. Holy Ghost fire. And he's in all of you. He loves every bit of you. He's embraced your snotty bits and your glorious bits already. There's no, we don't have to construct a barrier, and even if we do, he's already on the other side of it. If you get that feeling sometimes that there's just a bit of a wall between me and the Lord, and this is the emotional, spiritual thing, sometimes we can feel it, and he just feels over there and over there. That is dualism. Stop and repent and say, thank you, Lord, you're on this side of the wall with me already. How can we walk through into a greater place of peace or life or light? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Any, any barrier we feel or think we have, they, they may be there for good reasons, and they may be real to us, but the greater reality, he's already on the, the other side of it with you. He's not shut out from any part of your being. <sighs> Hence, this is why Paul says in Romans 12, in view of the mercy of God, Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be squeezed into its mold. Do not be a Greek dualist. They were facing this in the first century just like we're facing it now. But be transformed or transfigured is the better translation. Be transfigured which is something happening from the inside to the outside. So be transfigured is letting that who's already in you to come out of you through changing your mind set your mind frame so it helps to learn verses it helps to not think about bad things but fundamentally it's to start thinking like Jesus is inside of me all the time I am reconciled to God so we think union not separation we present 
We're, he's present, not distant. We're fully embraced and fully loved. He's already in every dark spot, and every person you meet has God's image in them. We get to call it out, invite them to participate in the love of God by the Spirit that he's already poured out for them. No exclusions. No exclusions. Hitler, Putin, nice people next door, all included in this incredible, incredible reality. But people choose darkness. That's one of the things that we learn from Scripture. They keep choosing darkness. That's their choice. But they don't have to because there's something much better. And I'm totally out of time. <laughs> Thanks, Jesus. I, I, can we pray? Is anybody excited or are you just confused? Holy Spirit, I pray that we would not be blinded. If you just want to put your hand on your head or your heart or something, if you want to do that just as a kind of external thing to do, because I pray that we would get that repentance mindset going on and we would reject all ideas of distance and animosity and know that you are in us and that you love us and that we're living from that thing that you've already done. Uh, do that in us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for listening.